Good afternoon, everyone. This is the first part of two video series. Aerosol injections revised upward 30 kilometers, which is about 100,000 feet. Oh, wait, revised up again, 39 kilometers, 128,000 feet. Oh, wait, revised yet again, 55 kilometers. That is 180,000 feet with the umbrella at 35 kilometers. Ash already visible from the space station. Different view. It's about the sulfur dioxide cloud moving now into the equatorial band, cooling as much as half a degree Celsius, possibly more, for the next six months or so. We're going to focus on the grain production in these areas, southern latitudes. Anywhere is gray mid-season. This is going to have the most difficulty and the losses associated with it. South Africa, we're going to go through all of southern Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and we'll go down to Australia. Part two of the video is going to be all of South America and what's happening there with a the drought already reducing numbers. This ash cloud and sulfur dioxide reflecting sun is going to do something that will reduce global crop yields. This is what we should be talking about immediately for solutions. Looks like Joe hasn't gotten the virus or the economy under control. And now we have inflation and cron cases skyrocketing. And do you think the stock market will trade higher in the next three years than it did from 2016 to 2020? Economists are comparing our current inflationary environment to the inflation era of the 1970s. Gold was up 20x, silver 37x in that 10-year period. Learn how simple it is to add physical gold and silver to your portfolio ahead of the rise in inflation and predicted price rises. Patriot Gold Group has a no fee for life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver. Call 1-800-356-4470. I get a free investor guide today. And with the knowledge that Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top rated gold IRA dealer from 2016 to present, click on the link in the description box below for more information. And now on with the video. And even more information has come out since I did the in-depth analysis of the Tonga eruption, looking at cloud top heights stating that the ash cloud is going to be far higher than the initial estimates of 65,000 feet. I was already looking at 100,000 foot plus based on temperatures at what was then measured at the cloud tops. Now official 30 kilometers, that's 100,000 feet. And revisions just keep on coming. Now it's 39 kilometers at 128,000 feet. Electroverse also putting together great amounts of information on this, along with Volcano Discovery. This off Himwari 8, center area there, plume, 55 kilometers. That's 180,000 feet into the atmosphere. The rest of the umbrella is sitting somewhere around 35 kilometers. This is definitely going to have an effect on our atmosphere. This is definitely going to have some effect on crop production in the southern hemisphere. Now, for those of you in the States who don't operate on the metric system, 55 kilometers is 180,000 feet. And if you move over to 35 kilometers, 114,000. But on the average, they're looking around 37 kilometers. These numbers just keep being revised by the 12 hour period. So that's why I want to bring part two in this series. Let's take a look at some of the ash emissions visible from the International Space Station. And I'm no rocket scientist, but for me, that looks like a lot of ash in the upper atmosphere that could block sunlight and have an effect on crops during the maturation phase, depending on where they're growing, what continent, and what species is being grown. This is going to continue to thin and spread for the next several months. Another view as the space station was moving around in its orbit much denser along that striated line in the center there. So I'm looking for the new images as Space Station comes around on its next orbit to see what the spread would be on this. 
Have you noticed there's been a lot of deflection? Oh, it's not that bad, it's not that thick, it's not that much sulfur dioxide. You're looking at the images. Let's start back on the 17th after the eruption. You can see the ash cloud already starting to head west in the, in the winds there. I was calling Cape York and other areas that were catchment basins to be covered in ash and uh, filters clogged and at least give farmers a couple day warning. Ash was inbound, so perhaps they could protect their animals and maybe put covers over the water. And sure enough, Modis shows this ash and sulfur dioxide heading east to west over the continent. Interesting spiral in the volcanic ash. And this band of ash hanging up around 55,000 feet or so, but it seems to be in multiple bands like the shockwave pattern was. It's quite amazing what's happening with the atmosphere and the discharge of the ash and sulfur dioxide starting to now sweep through southern hemisphere. What you're looking at here, sulfur dioxide. Hemwari 8 picking this up. Put all the links in the description box below so you can do some of your own research and also the in-depth Look at the Tonga eruption previous video. I had all the satellite links in there for you so you could just go direct onto the live, see what you could find as you scrolled through and put different layers in there. Now, this is on the 19th, a couple days back. Notice where the circle is in red. But keep in mind, that is the frontal boundary of the sulfur dioxide. Where it originated from was way past the end of the disc over there in Tonga that you can barely see. So it's looking that it's already absolutely going to be encompassing the entire southern hemisphere. And Centennial 5, picking up some more sulfur dioxide concentrations here. This was in the very initial stages of the eruption. So again, all conjecture was, don't worry about it, it was only 400,000 tons of sulfur dioxide, nothing to see here. Wasn't even a fraction of what Pinatubo was. Wasn't even a fraction of what Mount St. Helens was. But this is in the first hours of the eruption. So again, what is this all clear, nothing to see here, go back to sleep, don't worry about it, messaging across the media. And we're looking at sulfur dioxide a couple days later on the 18th. You can see the plume moving, higher in altitude, higher in concentrations. But then what's interesting is today's readings. This is 16 hours ago. The density of this eclipses anything man-made on the planet. If you look up in China or even in India, what we're seeing here with this dark red brick almost going to black, how much sunlight do you think that's going to reflect back to space? You're talking about geoengineering, and this is one of the most dangerous things with a geoengineering project, was if we had a VEI 5 or 6, that would take three years for the ash to rain out of the air, yet they put all those particulates up there. Then we have a double overlay of particulates reflecting sunlight. So would it be a runaway effect? And that's what I think we should be talking about as well. We're seeing geoengineering projects everywhere. Harvard's talking about it. Yale's talking about it. NASA's talking about it. There's so many people already in experimentation with this. And now we have a volcanic eruption to add in. So one plus one probably does not equal two with the reflectivity with all those different particles up there. One thing for sure though, Southern Hemisphere is going to cool, lasting until spring. Well, if it takes two months to kick in, that's already spring. So I don't know if he's talking about Southern Hemisphere spring, which is many months from now, they would have to go through their winter, which is six months, eight months from now. That's the duration, a six to eight month cooling of at least a half a degree Celsius drop. It's probably going to be more. Just my opinion, based on knowing what geoengineering projects are up there, in addition to what the ash layering is. So we'll start the analysis right here. Production of grains, black box, which I inserted there. These are the areas that will be the most affected with the ash and the temperature drops and effects on plant growth. These are the production, not the exports, which I'm going to cover in tomorrow's video because I wanted to really delve into South America because they're major producers and exporters of soy and corn. And if we look at the oil seeds, soybeans, etc., we see the same. All these areas are going to be greatly affected. So plants in a growth stage, if you're coming into the harvest season, plants are mature. They're not going to be too affected by this. But if they're in the mid-season range, still growing, still maturing, 
Absolutely, greatly affected. And if there's acid rain associated with this, that's one factor to consider. Sulfur dioxide reflection of sunlight, temperature differences, that's another thing. This for sure is gonna shift weather patterns, rainfall patterns. So you can see all these other factors adding up in to crop losses, which will be felt, reductions in yield, which are assured now. Let's take a look at Angola. We're looking at the gray mid-season. This is your target point here. Botswana is going to be greatly affected. Everything in the growth stage right now is mid-season. So I would call massive reductions in Botswana and agriculture at the moment. Angola, so there's only another month of maturation, and then they're into the harvest season for the corn. And if we swing over to Lesotho and Madagascar, again, really going to have a problem in this mid-season growth stage. Corn sorghum, Lesotho. Corn, sorghum, rice in Madagascar, heavily affected. Being that far south, right at the edge of the ash spinning around. This is going to be some of the densest ash. And sulfur dioxide concentrations is right in that band if you follow across from where the eruption was. Head west from Australia. And where do you run into first? Malawi, Mozambique, these countries in southern Africa. So looking up at Malawi, corn, cotton, rice, and sorghum reductions. Mozambique, corn, cotton, sorghum reductions. Now, how does this bode for other countries that expect or need exports from some of these Southern African nations? South Africa, for example, exporter. But look where they sit in the mid-season growth stage. Absolutely going to be tremendous difficulties. Supply chains are broken there as well. A lot of things happening with the farmers not able to get to full production anyway. And then we're looking at the corn in the east, the corn in the west. Cotton, the millet, the sorghum, soybeans. Reductions in every single one of those. Percentages of reduction unknown at the moment, but reductions nonetheless. And if we come over to Zambia and Zimbabwe, these are going to be heavily affected as well. Every one of their crop species is in mid-season, mid-growth. Africa's going to have a very difficult time and look out in the future for skyrocketing prices, inavailability, and food across the media from this. Africa's going to feel it first, right along with parts of Australia. Western Australia mainly, with the rice, the sorghum, and the corn. Queensland, they're coming into the edge of the maturation season, into the harvest season. So what do we look at in Queensland? The millet would be affected most there. And hopefully this gives you a good idea of where we're going with this cooling for now. I'll bring you part two in-depth analysis of South America, what was going on with the drought anyway reducing yields in addition to each individual nation by nation. And I also wanted to include the exports and nations that are exported to from South America that are going to have some difficulties sourcing the food they need. This is dovetailing into a global nightmare. And I do talk more about these issues in the podcast, many Ice Age conversations. And join me over on Telegram, adapt2030t.me. I hope you got something out of the video, and I really hope that this starts some conversations on what we're going to do moving into this food reduction phase for the next six months to a year on our planet. I do hope you got something out of the video. Like I said, come for part two, which will be finished tomorrow, so I can update the satellite imagery and follow the ash a little bit further out, see where the spread's going, and I'll see you next time.